Yes, yeah, secure for me. <clears throat> so the red light is on. Uh, first off, uh, you've seen, like everybody else, um, Elon Musk taking over Twitter. It seems like a good time we think to ask. Uh, there's been a few people in Taiwan that have expressed concerns because of his recent positions pro China. Um, what's your take on it? Well, in Taiwan, uh, we've always been in the front line, um, in the face of authoritarian expansionism. And uh, our country experiences a significant uh, amount of foreign cyber attacks daily. Uh, and so on um, any platforms, uh, including Twitter, but also Facebook and things like that, uh, we need to uh, be constantly vigilant against not just cyber attacks, but also uh, disinformation, information manipulation, and so on. Fortunately, uh, the largest foreigners in Taiwan, for example, the PPP, uh, which is uh, entirely in the social sector, funded by the Taiwan Academic Network and run by a student club in the National Taiwan University, uh, is community governed, meaning that it's open source, we become a moderator through participation, and it doesn't serve an advertiser or shareholder's interest. And it's been running in such an open way for the past 25 years. So it was good grassroots civil society. I wouldn't say alternative because it's in the mainstream. Uh, we are reasonably sure that we can provide uh, examples, models uh, for the privately controlled now uh, public spaces, uh, which is kind of an uh, interesting contrast uh, to emulate the kinds of PDP, grassroots community governance, uh, rather than strictly speaking serving. Uh, just advertisement or shareholders value maximization. Uh, but with Mr. Musk's uh, recent positions uh, saying that uh, Taiwan should accept the One China policy, is there the potential of Twitter disserving Taiwan's community? Uh, as I mentioned, uh, there's no over dependence uh, on Twitter. Uh, when it comes to social media engagement. Uh, in addition to, of course, PPT, um, Decard, Berg, uh, Line, you, you name it, uh, there's also a sizable uh, population in Taiwan also working with, for example, Facebook and YouTube and so on. So because it's heterogeneous, it's that is a plural uh, network of possible engagement venues, we minimize the risk of one single um, operator uh, taking over the cognitive landscape, so to speak. Uh, you did mention in your first answer disinformation. Mm -hmm. How much of a problem has it particularly been disinformation, hacking, cyber attacks since this past summer? Yeah, so uh, in terms of cyber attacks, uh, for example, last year in 2021, on average, we get 5.9 million of cyber attack incidents, attempts at infiltrating or attacking our government websites and premises uh, per day. So millions per day. And that's up from 2.7 million uh, per day the year before uh, 2020. So it is indeed growing. But this year, when the U.S. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi visited in August, we've seen this unprecedented 23 times increase from the previous peak uh, in terms of denial of service attack from abroad. Uh, of course, it didn't compromise um, any like financial documents and so on, but it did result in a couple of websites from the government's website uh, not providing service outages uh, for a couple of hours and so on. And during those outages, we've seen this information uh, running rampant, uh, like the uh, black hat hackers have taken over uh, the Ministry of National Defense, have taken over the president's office, and so on. Uh, so this is quite unique, right? This is a cyber attack coupled with this information. Information manipulation is a coordination uh, between the more hard cyber attack parts and the more soft uh, parts of propaganda. Fortunately, uh, we countered it rather quickly, uh, and I said that uh, the same hour as the uh, drill uh, that happened uh, by the PLA uh, around our vicinity, uh, we put up our ministry's website, moda.gov.tw, and said quite publicly, we invite everyone to test our defenses, and we tie ourselves uh, with the interplanetary file system, or IPFS, uh, the Web3 backbone, 
so that anyone around the world, more than 200,000 computers, can choose to help Moda, our ministry, back up our website, keeping us afloat, available, at pinning uh, on IPFS, our website's content. It really worked. We got a lot of interest from our protocol lab, the designer of IPFS, but also from the wider NFT, like Board Ape and so on, communities. Uh, and so I think this is also a great sh show of solidarity and resilience, not just from Taiwan, but from everyone that identifies with Taiwan's message of keeping this free and open Pacific uh, and connecting to the world. Um, do you view it as something in the United States said the biggest challenge to democracy right now is these cyber attacks and this disinformation that's I'm guessing bound to continue to grow from China. Mm -hmm. Back in 2014, uh, there's many takes on this matter. Right? The PRC itself uh, had some online freedom of press, of speech, and so on before 2014. Uh, but they, uh, around that time, decided that this viralness uh, is too much of a threat and they need to basically do a zero eight uh, containerization, harmonization uh, of the online landscape. On the other hand, in Taiwan, uh, we decided otherwise. Uh, we thought maybe we can engage uh, with people on the pro-social sides of social media by making sure that people learn the art of really journalism, checking facts, understanding the framing fact, and so on, and fact check our three presidential candidates as they're having their forums and debates. Uh, we make sure that even our middle schoolers and so on can have fact-checking uh, and contributing to the collaborative fact-checking effort as their kind of favorite pastime. And once we do that, this practice of civic journalism serves as a immunization. It protects people, builds mental antibodies against the kind of divisive outrage that conspiracy theories, disinformation campaigns, and so on, uh, try to evoke. Uh, so this idea of humor over rumor, of notice and public notice, these new playbooks out meaning uh, the outrage uh, become quite popular in Taiwan. I'm happy to report uh, that just as we never had a single day of lockdown, during the almost three years of COVID now, uh, but still very successfully contained the pandemic, we very successfully uh, countered again those disinformation attacks and so on without any administrative takedowns uh, based on content. So uh, instead of like zero hate or so on, uh, we out me, we use humor over rumor and so on uh, for digital resilience for all. Um, you talk about the digital resilience right now. Mm -hmm. I've seen it quite recently as a main topic. What can be done to make sure Taiwan and its citizens actually is uh, resilient and ready? Fine. Uh, and you, you mentioned uh, Elon Musk and Twitter, uh, but also quite popular in the conversations nowadays uh, is non-geostationary satellites, which includes the mid uh, Earth orbit as well as low Earth orbit. Um, as we have seen uh, from the Russian uh, assault, uh, brutal war against uh, Ukraine, there's a lot of interest worldwide uh, to understand what's actually happening in Kiev uh, when, when Kiev was being attacked. Uh, I myself stayed up all night trying to refresh all the information sources, including the Kiev Independent, uh, the, their local journalism. Uh, but consider, if they do not have broadband access at Kiev, then the same appetite for information will be satisfied by disinformation. And we will no longer then have the chance uh, to learn what's actually going on in Kiev. And President Zelensky will not have the opportunity uh, to talk to leaders around the world and also out uh, the propaganda. Uh, nowadays, we all still remember, right? he said, uh, I need ammunition on the right, uh, and so on. And that's out uh, the propaganda. So uh, what I'm trying to get at is that we need to make sure that even in the largest of the um, disasters, earthquakes, multiple very large earthquakes, uh, that damages uh, our submarine cables and so on, we still need a, a connection to the wider democratic network, and which is why we're investing uh, 15 million US dollars or so uh, over the next couple of years to build, as I mentioned, non-geostationary orbits, more than seven 
uh, hundred different stations around Taiwan, some fixed, some mobile, so that uh, when that happens, uh, the journalists can still uh, report uh, to across the world uh, by having uh, real-time access to more land. So, but let's say there was an attack or an, an invasion attempt tomorrow morning or next week, would you be ready? How much time do you need to be ready and where you want to be? Well, just like earthquakes, right? earthquakes don't give us a lot of advance warning either, usually just a minute or so or even less. So because we plan this idea of all hazards uh, scenario, if we're quick enough for earthquakes, uh, mitigation and so on, then we're quick enough for all the other kinds of disasters. Uh, so I think the idea here is continuous uh, improvement. We learned from earthquakes just a uh, month ago, there were three large earthquakes uh, successfully. Uh, so the idea is that uh, we learn from each uh, typhoon, each earthquake, each cyber attack, each disinformation crisis and so on. Uh, and then we successfully counter these by providing uh, advanced warnings and also learning uh, from those new tactics. So I don't think there is uh, a like perfect score that we would just uh, be there, but instead uh, we would just keep agile and make sure that every citizen understands the toolkits available uh, to get the messages out and also to uh, counter against propaganda and disinformation. Um, you mentioned uh, lower, uh, low and middle orbit uh, uh, backup systems, if you will. We seem to come back to Mr. Musk again, and uh, in this case, it's Starlink. Would you have to be reliant on Starlink, or do you have your own network that would be up and running? Right. So uh, this year already, uh, we work with uh, SES, which is a European uh, company that provides a mid earth orbit connectivity. So we work already with the Xinju Fire Service, uh, as well as local firms such as Pegatron. Uh, and Microsoft uh, together to provide mobile 5G ORAN uh, telecommunication towers, so mini towers uh, that could be uh, put on a vehicle so that if there's a fire or any emergency, uh, the firefighters uh, with their cars can actually provide emergency connectivity backed by mid Earth orbit satellites. So again, we're looking for um, solutions not from a single vendor, but from a mix, a heterogeneous plural mix of possible vendors uh, that provides the bandwidth and also low latency communications. How um, unprecedented is it for somewhere in the world like Taiwan to have to go all in on digital security because of the threat and because of the proximity of, let's say, China and the different conditions right now? Well, I think all democracies are facing this common challenge, uh, especially leading up to elections and so on. There will always be uh, separate attacks or disinformation attacks and so on. It just so happens uh, that Taiwan is kind of the place uh, where all those latest uh, tactics, those new emerging tactics, are first being tried upon. Um, so we get the, the new virus mutations, so to speak. Uh, but then it also uh, makes our cybersecurity industry stronger. Uh, another thing is that Taiwan is at the root of trust for many things. For example, semiconductor. Uh, the Taiwanese chips are used in all over the world uh, for scientific or even military uh, computational needs. And that is a lot of trust, right, on our capability uh, to produce trustworthy chips. So I say that MIT made in Taiwan, the T also stands for trustworthiness which is why we also need to double down in investing in cybersecurity standards, for example, the E187, that protects the entire supply chain for chip making for semiconductors, uh, to make sure that this uh, software cybersecurity defense is coupled with this trustworthiness uh, in the hardware supply chain. So these two go hand in hand. So I would say that all democracies face the same threat, uh, but Taiwan is also part of the solution. The Taiwanese chips our cybersecurity capabilities, our know-hows in countering disinformation, our way of doing digital democracy to build bridges, collaboration across diversity. All of these are antidotes or possible solutions to this common challenge. You always bring it back to solutions when I ask questions. Mm -hmm. You seem to be very confident and level-headed. What mm -hmm. keeps you up at night? Uh, 
<laughs> I mean, I literally <laughs> waking up uh, from bed uh, by early morning earthquakes. And, and this is the reality of Taiwan, right? Uh, we're caught between the Eurasian plate on the one side and the Philippine Sea plate on the other. Uh, and the plates keep bumping into one another. There's on average three filled earthquakes somewhere in Taiwan every day, uh, just like cyber attacks. So uh, I think this instilled in us uh, a sense of resilience and also the kind of optimism uh, you just described. Because uh, while bumping into each other, it also raised the tip of Taiwan, the Jade Mountain or Yushan, by a couple of centimeters every year. So we, we kind of grow up because of those tectonic tensions uh, and bumping into each other. So similarly, I think we can deliver uh, with other partner democracies a recipe for democracies to matter, to matter even more in the digital age, instead of sliding back democracy uh, by, you know, saying uh, this virus, this toxic so-called social media is a threat, so we need to do a top-down, shutdown, lockdown, or something like that, zero hate, or something like that. Uh, we instead uh, deliver solutions, vaccines, cures, and things like that, that protects the people from those virus of the mind to uh, immunize the population. But this is never done in a top-down way, but through voluntary collaboration in especially civic journalism. What's the biggest challenge to get to the resilience you want to get to? Mm -hmm. Yeah, a couple of things, right? So first, this resilience civic journalism only works if the internet works. Uh, if there's no internet connectivity, if all the submarine cables have been cut, uh, well, the best civic journalism training is for not. Uh, which is why, of course, uh, including the non geostationary orbit satellites, uh, we need to configure a truly resilient uh, network topology so that people can still have access to high bandwidth communication channels no matter what lies asked them. Uh, and the other challenge uh, is to make sure that democracies around the world understand that this is a common challenge. This is not just singly targeting Taiwan. Sooner or later, the playbooks uh, from Taiwan uh, will be needed around the world as well, as people face this common threat of both cyber uh, threats, cyber attacks, as well as disinformation. Is there um, an effort of backing up everything in terms of government servers or mm -hmm. internet access in case the internet goes down as you mentioned? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, so we use a hybrid cloud model uh, in Moda, in our ministry, as I mentioned. With our website, the homepage, uh, moda.gov.tw, is both backed up on the Anycast uh, network of um, content delivery networks, the CDNs, around the world, but it's also backed up by volunteers running the IPFS system, donating their spare hard drive um, capabilities and connectivity capabilities to help to keep us afloat. So there's uh, a site uh, that we partner with the system vendors around the world, invest in them, but also uh, there's a site that just works with the grassroots support, and both are important. So I think this backing up, uh, it goes beyond uh, just a website. Uh, we can also share uh, the know-how, the public code, as we say, uh, in mitigating such cyber attacks. Case in point, uh, the grassroots group, uh, G0V or F0, uh, who collaboratively designed this COFAX system that makes sure that middle schoolers and really everyone uh, can flag even in end-to-end -end encrypted channels apply uh, incoming uh, disinformation as spawn and collaboratively fact-check those spawn together without compromising privacy. Now this system, because it's entirely open source, this is in the commons, in the digital commons, uh, many other jurisdictions, uh, civil society groups, simply deployed the same system. So if you change cofax.org, uh, remove the ads and go to cofax.org, you get into the pilot version, for example. Uh, and so I think this uh, idea of grassroots co-creation for the digital commons forms the digital infrastructure and digital spaces uh, in the modern age. And I think this, more than anything, is how Taiwan can help by providing recipes. But instead of patenting it or uh, selling it for profit, we just open source it. So the uh, world uh, can learn uh, from our playbook and improve upon this. Do you think Taiwanese people are 
aware enough of the effort and participation they will be needed to make in order to make this successful? Well, uh, sometimes it does take a wake-up call. Uh, around the uh, turn of the century, 99, uh, the September 21st, uh, large earthquake, the GT earthquake, uh, basically woke everyone up. Uh, and then we uh, redesigned our buildings, our urban planning, everything with resilience against earthquakes in mind. So similarly, uh, the Ukrainian uh, situation, the Kiev uh, situation, as well as uh, following uh, U.S. head speaker uh, Nancy Pelosi's visit, the hybrid cyber and disinformation attacks uh, served to wake everyone up uh, for the necessity for people to be aware of these things going on, but also not to panic, but rather learn the sort of civic journalism, the resilience, uh, training and so on that one needs to go through uh, to have good cybersecurity hygiene and so on. Thank you very much. And we're good.